Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Thomas Simon Laritaz, and I have the pleasure to chair this session about the UK after Brexit. We have the chance to uh, have with us uh, Lord Way of uh, Shoreditch, as well as uh, Dinash uh, Damidja, and um, uh, another colleague uh, who is trying to join, uh, Moti uh, Kessler. Uh, Moti, actually, I cannot see you. Are you, are, are you connected now? He wants the mic. Ah, ah, there he is. Yeah. Here is Moti. Okay. So, uh, Moti, you're in two, you've got two things going. So you need to cancel one of them. Otherwise, it does an echo. I may need to make sure that I'm cancelling the right one. Correct. <laughs> Okay, there. and 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 I see that some participants already start joining. So welcome everybody for this session on Brexit. And uh, obviously, all of us when traveling abroad keep on being bombarded by questions about what does it mean Brexit and and what is the impact and what do you think will will happen. And I think we, we are blessed to have three formidable speakers to, to try to explore these questions today. And uh, I, I would like to start perhaps with uh, uh, a very uh, down to the ground uh, a business perspective. Uh, Moti, you are uh, an industrialist. You are running a chemical business. Uh, what has changed for you and for your business since Brexit? Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's not only that our business is focused on chemicals, but all of us, even that we are not aware of, are engaging with chemicals on a daily basis because there is nothing around us that is not made by chemicals, from the food, from what we wear, from pharmaceuticals, from uh, something that we communicate with, like the iPhone, it's all made by chemicals. And um, what has changed is that it all became more complicated uh, to produce products, to deal with products, but it is not yet as complicated as it will be probably in a year because the UK and Europe suspended a lot of what they wanted to do. Uh, but to put some numbers in perspective, uh, all the products that are made in the UK, which are made by chemicals, 60% of these raw materials are coming from Europe into the UK. And what the UK makes goes to Europe, about 60% is exported. Uh, numbers are about 50 billion euros of trade. And all these products are highly regulated by a regulation that is called REACH that was established nearly 20 years ago, which stands for Registration, Evaluation, and Assessment of Chemicals. There are 21,000 products that have been registered. Companies invested a lot of money in testing them, making sure that they are safe. These are companies in Europe which, and the UK. And this all has been disconnected, which means that Products will not arrive into the UK without being retested uh, at the border, approved by, for processes. So life in many areas will stop unless there will be an agreement between Europe and the UK um, to align the regulations, which gives me a lot of comfort because I think it will be so impossible that the politicians on both sides of the water will have to a change and accept that they need to allow the alignment. And I'm going to elaborate, but I can, as you can see, I can talk about it for. <laughs> well, Moti, th thank you, thank you so much for these uh, initial initial thoughts. Uh, you're talking about trade of of product. Actually, concerning the services, last week uh, the Aston University in Birmingham estimated that uh, uh, the UK services export shrank by over 110 billion pounds over the last four years. 
And their estimate was that actually the service industry was actually much more severely hit than uh, the chemical or, or other physical goods that are being uh, traded uh, across the uh, across the channel. Um, now, uh, p- perhaps, uh, uh, Dinesh Damidja, you, you, you could give us your perspective. You're, you're, coming, you're, you're uh, a first generation migrant in, in the UK. You are an entrepreneur with e-bookers. You are also a politician because you were a member of the European Parliament. Um, is uh, the testimony of Moti surprising to you? And is that what, what you hear when you talk to your constituents? Well, as far as I can tell you, and, and needless to say, I was a Remainer. Uh, and thus, uh, you know, you, you might think that my, well, my, my views are clouded from that point of view. So I'm, I'm making that a case up front. But this is a classic case of heart trumping head, where sovereignty is more important than economics. And wealth was not important at all whether we lost, as you just said, 110 billion in services over the last four years. I, I could not understand uh, when, you, when all your, our businesses reduced their market from 520 million people to 68 million people, if that was not going to hit us when tariff barriers went up. Um, Obviously, as businessmen, we would just go and set up a, a, an office or a business in the EU. And thus, the 450 million people that we lost from a service business point of view, we would then get back. But the biggest thing here is the transfer, massive shift, shift of employment. Because if most of your businesses were in the UK, running 520 million people, and now they're just going to be running 68, you have to shift people from the UK to the continent, or you'll have to re-employ people or employ people on the continent, which means you'll have to let go of people here. Uh, This has obviously been masked by COVID-19 and government support. But an example the Amsterdam Stock Exchange in April 2021 traded more volume than the London Stock Exchange. Just, just one example. Uh, the same thing in services is going on uh, when we start playing the immigration card that was played very well by the Brexit community. They campaigned on a couple of fears that immigrants superior will be coming to live next to you, which means the Turks or the Syrian refugees, and that Europeans will be taking your jobs. Well, now there's an acute shortage of staff in restaurants, pubs, hotels, cafes, all the service businesses. Tim Martin of Weatherspoons, who was the poster boy of Brexit and um, was filmed number of times with Boris uh, saying there's nothing wrong with Brexit will do far better wants EU workers to be allowed back because he can't open his pubs and he used to employ 40,000 people in all his Weatherspoon chain of pubs so just to give you a couple of examples of what's happening now um, after Brexit thank you so much Dinesh uh, Lord Way, what, what is your perspective on that? Where do you think we're heading? And uh, is the trajectory as dramatic as what uh, Moti and Dine described to us? Or do you think actually uh, there might be an opportunity linked with Brexit in, uh, in designing a trajectory that could actually uh, uh, be more prosperous and successful? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'll lay my cards on the table. I, you know, I studied French and German at Oxford, spent a year in, as a student in Germany. I, I love Europe. Uh, I certainly wouldn't subscribe to the, as you can see from my face, the, the more racist end of some of the uh, Brexiteer narratives. But at the end of the day, just before the vote, 
decided, you know, there are some reasons why, from a political perspective, okay, let's put economics one side, there's a reason why sovereignty uh, perhaps swung it in the end, plus some of the marketing, yes, but there's a core group of people who aren't racist, I'm not one of them, <laughs> who kind of go, well, maybe there is an argument here. And, and part of that is to do with equality. So the global world that we've seen that we, we constructed post of the world wars, Europe, you know, the rebuilding process, very important for creating a stable trading system. But there are various imbalances that were hardwired in and built in over the years that perhaps favoured certain places. So in the UK, that would be London and certain industries or size of organisations at possibly the expense of other parts of the UK. And those other parts of the UK kind of started to vote quite differently from the way they voted for the last 50 years, for, including for the current prime minister. So there's certainly a political imperative, whether you like it or not, whether you think these people are stupid or not, they are affecting politics here. They started to in America. They may do so elsewhere in the world. And we can't kind of totally ignore that just because we want to maintain the system that we've had. Um, now, there was because of the sovereignty argument, uh, a rationale which said things will be painful maybe not as painful as a complete Armageddon collapse, which we're still waiting to see if that will happen. But you're right, there are labor shortages. There are problems with getting imports and exports out. And some of that's to do with the relationship with Europe and standards and so on. One thing I've noticed though, since the pandemic, uh, and, and you notice you know, the vaccine uh, situation in the UK, where um, we're, we're getting pretty close to uh, vaccinating much of the adult population here is that we are entering a world, I believe, where there's going to be greater volatility, greater risk. The stable trading systems that we, re that we relied on, including uh, the European one, may start to crack <laughs> or not just be fit for purpose for a digital world where people can do you know, business in so many different ways and you've got blockchain coming, many disruptions coming. And so that is a threat to stability and climate change, uh, political, geopolitical instability, and so what we're learning from the pandemic is, uh, yes, it's important to have global trading systems, but it's also sometimes important to protect your country's health or your look. There, there's an important need to invest in local areas that might get left behind or have their own identity. Think about the various separatist movements that are rising up. And so how do you respond to that in a flexible way? Do you deal with it still from the top down or do you find a mix of top down plus some bottom up and some middle, particularly the closer you get to real people, the more it's about their culture. So things like health, education, collecting the dustbins is a very local, you know, it's about culture, it's about your cultural identity. The things that relate to pure economics, global trading systems, blah, 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 start to go, you know, to a point in the climate change, you start to need to operate, especially at a very global level. But not everything has to be done either at the regional or the local, uh, at the uh, international level, some things are local. So my, my kind of prediction, and we've seen form when the UK moved away from Europe in previous centuries even, is that the UK might not be the biggest economy in future. And there are others moving further outside of Europe, frankly, that will be bigger. I, mean, I heard the other day Nigeria may have a billion people in the next 10 or 20 years, which is amazing. Um, we may not be the uh, wealthiest or have the largest sphere of influence, especially hard influence, although UK has a lot. I think the interesting play for the UK is to be the most resilient and the most agile of the advanced nations that when it needs to rebuild from scratch, pretty much a farm, uh, vaccine manufacturing industry in six months, it can do so. Building on its research base, building its heritage and what it's learned and start what to work with, yes, Europe, but also other regions of the world to spread some of the lessons it's learning itself about how to be an agile political and economic environment and spread that learning uh, globally. That requires action. Again, British law is great for that. We're a very agile law. We don't have a written constitution. Smart procurement, uh, being a real center for fintech, life sciences, betting on people within and beyond government. Kate Bingham, who, who chaired our vaccine program, is an example from business, but where we're small enough as a nation to know each other so we can find the Kate Binghams rather than them having to be found within a 500 million population. And then harnessing the small teams and wisdom of our own people as the asset uh, you know, to move forward. I don't want to make a kind of political uh, nationalist point, but one of the reasons why Britain's navy was so good, especially vis-a-vis -vis its European competitor before Spain, was the Spanish boats were huge. You know, they were hard to shift. They're a bit like the boat that got stuck in the sewers. Nelson, however, his boats were very small and very agile. And so he was able to defeat a much larger 
uh, navy, and eventually, you know, Britain w was able to kind of take the maritime trade uh, em sort of world, as it were, because of its nimbleness and agility. And I think that's the strength that Britain needs to double down on. It will be painful. But as it becomes more digital, as it, it starts to explore more fintech, more ledger based technologies and learn from other nations around the world about what they've done, you know, uh, all around the world, then I think, you know, there is I'm betting on Britain to bounce back in that sense. And it's regions to benefit because the more digital you are, in theory, the more you can put work in places that currently don't have any work apart from, you know, to do the fields or to be in a, in a, in a, in a factory somewhere in the north where it's your only option. I grew up in one of those communities. I know what it's like. Um, I'd like to see a different world for, 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 for those kinds of communities. Thank, thank you so much, Nat. Uh, obviously, one of, one of the questions that uh, people are asking is, isn't there a risk that actually it's the people who voted for the Brexit who will be the most severely impacted by the economic consequences of the Brexit? And in a way... London is much more agile and as higher education uh, workers who will find a way, even if now the Amsterdam stock, stock Exchange is trading more than London, there, there might be some other venues for Londoners. But uh, the people who are stuck producing chemicals like uh, the, uh, the people working in, in Motis factory, isn't there here a real risk that they will be the most severely impacted by, by the situation? Yeah, I think it's it's quite easy for us who live in capital cities or major cities to think like that. And that, you know, as a graduate, it's interesting. The research has shown that graduates, I'm one from one of the best universities in the world. We are very stuck in our ways. We don't change our minds. Once we've made our decision, the statistics say we don't change our minds. What you find in these working class communities, on the other hand, and certainly I know the Anglo-Saxon, the white working class, we call it, is they can hold multiple contradictory views. <laughs> it's interesting. There's a much more malleable And you could say, well, that's stupid. And, you know, but things don't have to be always black and white. They can be quantum. They can be both. And and I think if you live in one of those communities, you have no choice right now. You can work in the factory or you can be unemployed. You frankly, when you voted for Brexit, you had nothing to lose because life was always going to be like that. Right. In a world in which high volume always wins, look, there exists low margins. Labor doesn't capture much of that low margin profit. So if you're today, you're in Newcastle and you have a job in a factory Tomorrow, you either have no job because the robot's taking your job or you're still working in a factory because you've got, you know, other people coming to take your job because you've got no education. However, if you believe that because of Brexit, that new new industries can create it like hydrogen or, or green investment that are indigenous, that want to favor local labor, then maybe your children or you yourself could both work in the windmill industry or the hydrogen industry or be managing the robots that are doing that work. But that's a different life. And we've seen in the recent elections that people aren't yet convinced that Brexit, despite the impact it's having on jobs and so on and so forth. And we'll see what happens after furlough. But they clearly didn't swing back to the Remain sort of parties. They felt like they made the right decision and they backed the right horse. And maybe they will fi find that they are wrong. But at the moment, they don't buy the argument that they're losing out, even if it's actually true. Does that make sense? That yeah. there's a kind of decision that they've made. They want to see a different future, if they, if they reverse their decision, they'll just have the past that they had before. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe to answer your question, to give some real life examples. So first of all, we do not manufacture much. We mainly blend and distribute products to a variety of industries. So we supply the automotive, we supply pharmaceutical, we supply aviation. And A big industry that you mentioned, people who will be impacted are people who work for the automotive industry who were set up by the Japanese, Toyota, Nissan. Yeah. These are well-paid jobs. We supply ingredients to these companies. Most of the ingredients are not made in the UK and they are highly integrated. After January 2022, because uh, regulation or following regulation has been extended, These products, unless there's an agreement on alignment, will not come to the UK. So basically, they won't be able to manufacture anymore if they are not recognized at the border because they don't follow the same regulations that has been part of the European regulations. Same applies for pharmaceutical industry. Same would apply for manufacturing products like the hand gels that we all use now. These ingredients are not made in the UK and they will not come unless there is alignment of regulations. So the impact will be immense. 
aviation, making uh, aircrafts. Even something simple, the UK still produces one third of energy from nuclear energy. The, the water that is cooling or the fluid are cooling the uh, energy, the nuclear power energy, some ingredients are not made in the UK. So the impact will be on all areas of life. And this is something that would be felt by all industries. And can, I was, can I just come in too? Like the, the next few years, all I'll say is it's forcing the UK to have to diversify its supply or sometimes reshore. So we saw Nissan come back. We're building gigafactories to make sure we have local production. But you're right, some of the car parts will take years to you know, either reshore or diversify. There, so there will be disruption. And that was the same you know, in previous events. But the end result, what my argument is, the end result will be a much more diversified sourcing strategy and hopefully a more resilient country and hopefully where some of, some of the value can be captured more you know, locally in those places that are felt left behind. Can I just uh, come in uh, and give you my experience with ebookers.com? We were um, in 11 countries and within four years, we had reached from zero to a billion dollars of sales because we were in 11 countries and we had a market of 300 million people. We couldn't have reached that volume if we'd been just in the UK. The other thing was that the southern countries in Europe, the Mediterranean countries, their travel patterns were different to the northern countries because they always traveled in August, etc. This was the time when we desperately needed cash flow in the northern countries. So this balance was amazing to, you know, obviously we all made mistakes in the internet in, in the early days, and that really helped. The next thing I found was that because the U.S. companies have three, a 330 million marketplace, they're much bigger, and they can always come and buy us. It's very difficult for us to go and buy them uh, in, in terms of, of size and in terms of, well, there are other, other things, uh, uh, you know, that are needed as well to buy. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, we as, I, I, the third example I'd give you is energy. If you look at wind and solar energy, and I'm now in the solar business, um, I'm setting up a 348 megawatt plant of solar farm in Romania. The southern countries are very good on solar. The northern countries are very good on wind. Wind drives electricity, uh, the production of electricity at night, solar during the day, wind in the winter, solar in the summer. And if you had a European grid, you would not be dependent on Russian gas. And I, I totally understand your point about agility. And that's what Motti and I and all the entrepreneurs are. We are agile. Otherwise, we would never have come to this country to study and then get into the rich list within 40 years, uh, the Sunday Times rich list. We can't do that. The main thing here is we immigrants are so, well, we're all three of us immigrants here that are talking. Uh, and I can tell you this, that we're the most resourceful especially the first generation, is the most resourceful in, 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 in weaving around like, this, like Nelson's boats, uh, et cetera, than the, the population that is here. So this exactly happened in the States. But what we're trying to essentially say here is you've got to allow immigration, which was banned, which was stopped by well, well, one of the big deals of Brexit, and... You still have um, you, you have to allow the intercourse of knowledge, which you say you can do in these small communities. And lastly, and I'm sorry I've gone on, I must talk about separatist movements in Europe that you mentioned. Well, we have them in Scotland and Northern Ireland too, and also in Cornwall. Uh, so it you know you can say the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I, on separatism, I'm not saying that anybody has solved this, but I think separatism everywhere evidences a desire from groups of people, you know, at local levels to have access to more resources and power that sometimes they felt, whether rightly or wrongly, was, was kind of clustered in 
places that are very distant, whether it's Westminster or Brussels or DC or Beijing or wherever, they don't feel they have control over their lives. Just when this thing gives them so much power, there's like a disconnect between their experience of this power and the, the other, you know, I can't like, I can't tell the council here how often to collect my rubbish. I wish they put sensors in and collect it when it was full. And sometimes they might have to not have to collect it for, for months, right? So that's well, citizen yeah. disempowerment manifests in different ways politically around the world and Brexit and things are, are symptomatic of, of, of that disconnect. One thing I will say is the immigrants, I think, are the key bridge. So the way I would see it, you know, Britain had uh, large numbers of Huguenots come from Europe sure. centuries ago. Two thirds of English people are descended from Huguenots, by the way. So most of the white working class, we think, may or may not have some of that entrepreneurship. They do because they have that from, you know, their Huguenot stock. What happened when they arrived is some of these communities, they embraced the arrival of the immigrants because they brought new technology, new industries. And I think that's Britain's overriding. Uh, our market is not very big. We're always going to have to find other markets elsewhere, whether Europe, you know, some of the developing America, a lot of businesses I'm working with, you know, they, they come to the UK to establish because we've got great fintech regulation compared to America. And then they grow into America and are fundamentally by, mar by market size or market, you know, volume, an American business, but they choose to be here because we can be more agile as far as regulation is concerned and help them innovate and help them, you know, uh, move forwards. And that, that there's a pro and con. We don't capture all the wealth, but equally we get some wealth we might not have gotten if we had been taken a much more robust, you know, Europe, one of the disadvantages, you, you know, this is, is the, the, the laws in Europe are much more risk averse in terms of innovation. So, for example, I think politicians are criminally liable, for example, uh, apart from waivers and things, for things like the vaccine, right? No. I, as a politician, I would hate well, to be... How do you explain Amsterdam? Yeah, so, well, the, the point... Well, Amsterdam is a different kind of uh, set of financial instruments. I don't okay. see a, lo a lot of the derivatives happening there. I see a lot of the kind of lower-risk financial trading going there, where no Amsterdam politician is going to go to prison for, you know, one of those going wrong. But if in Europe there is a sense that it's harder to do innovation sometimes because you have to overcome that risk... Uh, in built in the law, then there is a play for countries like UK, small as they are, to then be a launch pad to the rest of the world. That's, I think that's the argument the government here is making. Mm -hmm. Are there some concrete examples where you think that this independence and this renewed agility could actually provide something concrete? Uh, for the social or economic development, something that was not possible uh, when uh, UK was part of the EU. Yeah, I, I, look, I've already given two examples. That life sciences will be big here because we've already got a great base, and we're now building effectively a man rebuilding a manufacturing industry for pr primarily for health security reasons. Um, we've mentioned uh, climate change. We've mentioned, you know, one of the things that um, Britain sometimes gold plates. European regulation. So a lot of things didn't happen in the past because of what's called um, state aid rules. The fact that you couldn't favor one industry or one part of the country uh, with you know, certain financial benefits. In fact, in Europe, throughout Europe, actually, there were lots of financial benefits being offered by national governments to their own regions. But the UK, because of our legal system, we take the law literally. So a lot of good things could have happened. You know, the North, when we got rid of mining, there was a plan to move to fracking in the 80s, like we could have shifted most of those workers. But, you know, ultimately, the, 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 the law, the lawyers here have had this kind of all the legislators have had this view where we can't overly favor certain regions. That's completely changed now. That was kind of already happening before Brexit. But the industrial policy mindset means, well, if we want Elon Musk to put a gigafactory in the Midlands, we're going to make as much as, you know, as much as we possibly can to make that possible. Same for hydrogen, same for, you know, any other new industry that can scale and employ local people. That's, the that's, that's one of the fascinating paradox also about Brexit is that actually the single market, the strongest advocate of building the single market uh, was the United Kingdom. And the strongest advocates of forbidding state aid was also the United Kingdom. So there seems yeah. to be a total reversal of position where okay. now the UK doesn't seem to regard... Uh, 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 the single market as an asset and state aid that the UK was fighting against decades after yeah. decades uh, now seems well, to be I, a priority. Can I, can I just come in there? Because I, I feel that um, uh, Berlin attracted Elon Musk for the Gigafactory and not the UK. 
<laughs> number one. Uh, and I don't know how that, you know, works in the argument. And climate change, we're very good at wind uh, in the UK, but not good at sun. So I'm not sure that the climate change argument, the Germans are way ahead. Uh, I mean, the continent is way ahead of the UK when it comes to the whole green energy setup. So I, I don't know about, and the, and the third no, point, I, that you made about, the third point you made about politicians being criminally liable. Well, I wasn't, you know, I'm, I haven't started, read the law there, but I was a politician there. I would have been made aware of that, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, definitely in, in Germany, and there is this principle within European law or national laws within Europe that is enshrined within the European legal infrastructure about the risk principle. So there is, a, there is definitely enshrined in law compared to the Anglo-Saxon system a different attitude to risk that affects the behavior of okay. officials. And, and well, I'll take your word for it. Can I just say, 50 years ago, Britain was a different place. We'd lost an empire. We were very insecure. We had, you know, the IMF had just come in. So the decisions that the country was making then were very different to today, where we are much more of an advanced, increasingly digital economy with a population that isn't right now backing us to be more European. It's backing us. And of course, back then, what was offered on the table was a trading system, not a trading system plus a legal system plus you know, a whole set of other regulations that we didn't think we were, that Europe was buying into. So, you know, I think we could, we could argue that one until we're blue in the face. On climate change, I have said climate change is one of those things that you need global work on because any pollution we create or China creates comes here. So I won't argue with you about, about climate change. I will say, though, Germany seems to be very good green energy, but I don't think if you, if you go under the cover, others, I think, on this call might back me up. I've spoken to people in the German energy industry who would say their system doesn't quite work. They're actually going to run out of energy because they're shutting down nuclear. They're still reliant on coal. The UK is actually more green or will be more green than Germany. And the only thing about UK is it doesn't have enough energy supply, so it's having to import it. But it's going to try and open more lines and find more ways to do that, store more energy, um, so I, I would say the UK has a resilient energy strategy that's emerging from its crisis. Germany may have a more, on the paper, green, you know, industry today. But as a nation, it's still going to be quite reliant, as you know, from other sources for quite a long time because it's taken its time. I, I don't, I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm setting up a high, green hydrogen plant. I'm setting up a green ammonia plant. I'm doing solar. And I know that on solar, if it hadn't been for the Germans, the prices would never have come down. The subsidies that they gave initially brought the prices of solar down, and it only because of the German. Now, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of say, uh, oh. but you say oh, someone no, no. told me this or said this, and and you will see this or no. I'm talking facts and making money. If making money, I mean, Motti, for example, is talking facts that okay, we'll have to, uh, you know. We will not be able to do this trading. We will not be able to do this manufacturing. Yes, your point is, we'll be agile and we'll invent. It's 30 to 40 years before we get back. I think possibly for the industries that you have and from the perspective of your businesses, which have been able to navigate the European system, yeah, I can understand that you will you know, take the view that you do. But, but there is also other evidence, and I'm not just saying hearsay, there is genuine, if you look at it from a citizen perspective, right now we have a labor shortage, some of that is due to furlough, but there are many of our industries which are growing, which will do well out of the new arrangements and need to hire more people. Yeah. So it's the net net that you've got to look at rather than just the one perspective of one industry or one company. I think it's the glass, <laughs> it's well the I think it's the glass half full, glass empty. There are both sides to it, I, frankly, uh, you know, obviously Brexit won, um, and 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 we are uh, doing Brexit, and, uh, and we will get hopefully good wagyu beef from Australia now, and we will uh, uh, sh perhaps the Welsh who, who really voted for Brexit, uh, the sheep farmers especially, will have ninety percent duty on sheep because ninety four percent of their sorry ninety four percent of their uh, sheep were going to Europe, and there'll be a 30 or 40 percent do but look frankly i'm all right jack i don't care it's not the attitude to go with if we want to really help everyone we should 
the intelligent will always, uh, and, 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 and the guys who got money will always win. Yep. But how do you carry the rest? It depends on your goal, right? If your goal is to make the UK the wealthiest country, then there are certain things you would do. You would, you would sit within you know, regional blocks like Europe. You would go for big markets. Whether the wealth that's made at the very top reaches the Welsh farmer, you know, I have friends who are Welsh farmers, they, they have a horrible life as it is. So whether, you know, whatever comes in future compared to what they have now, you know, it's, it's kind of almost much of a muchness, right? But the, the key thing is, can we be a resilient country? Because we're not the biggest and we're not the wealthiest and there'll be other wealthier countries. But can we survive? If we can survive, then we can be there to fight another day. And I think that is a achievable goal for the UK in the medium term. I don't think it will take 30 years because we have to survive now. And we've shown this last year that we can just about do that. <laughs> I wanted to ask you some, some other questions, but uh, I'd like to see if we could enlarge the debate to the participants. Uh, and uh, I think that the participants, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you should request to get the microphone. And I don't see any microphone request here. Um, uh, I see a lot of participants have raised hands, but I don't know what it means. Uh, guys, do you do, are you better at IT than me on that? So I'll try here. I click. Or, or people could chat, uh, put the question in the chat, and we can look at the chat. Yeah. Uh, uh, you may need to click on a hand raised. I'm not sure if it will work. Okay. Well, then, then maybe, I, I mean, I have a question to the three of you. Uh, I, I, was, um, I was fascinated by Moti's point about the fact that some of the regulations uh, uh, enjoy an extension period till the 31st of December 2021. Um, and I imagine that uh, there are a set of other decisions that need to be implemented in, in the coming years. So what do you collectively think, the three of you, should the UK do to make the best out of this Brexit situation? And what, what are the key uh, decisions or uh, the key moments that need to be uh, seized? I don't know who wants to start on that. Yeah, but it, I think it comes to the negotiation of to extend it. And uh, uh, the last paragraph, uh, Lord, where you spoke about resilience, and this is a key because you cannot eat and dress digital. Digital is great, but it's not for everyday life. Uh, and in order for the UK to continue and manufacture all the products we need for everyday life, then we need alignment of regulations. If not, it means to duplicate, to repeat animal testing that was done for 20 years on the European level. But it also means a lot of cost for registration, a lot of time. This doesn't make sense neither to the UK nor to Europe. So if common sense will prevail of agreeing to align regulations on trade of raw materials, chemicals, this will be the benefit of the UK resilience. Europe as well. My, my point on that is, and, and I think I'm, I'm veering more towards Lord Way, and that is that necessity is the mother of invention, guillotine, and, 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 and just put us in the deep end, uh, and, and you sink or swim, and normally you'll swim. Uh, the, the thing is that I'm, I'm much older than Lord Way, so I'm looking at the next 10 years, Uh, and he might be looking at the next 40. So our perspectives are different. But I would, I would uh, we're not going to get anywhere in this. Even on what we've negotiated on Northern Ireland, uh, we're tracking back. So perhaps one way of uh, give and get might be the way to go. I, I have no clue as to where these guys are going. But to, you see, the vaccination success was a really good good thing, and that was agility to a certain extent. But the sending old people with COVID into, into uh, old age homes, so that uh, was the worst thing I've ever heard. So that most of the old, I mean, we have the largest old people's death rate in the whole of Europe. 
because they sent people with COVID back to, just to free up hospital beds. So no one's talking about that as much as they talk about the vaccination, we did vaccination, we did vaccination. You know, and by the way, it wasn't six months that that vaccine, they were already in trials for a long time. It didn't take uh, that short a time to do it. Having said that, there were enough mistakes made, and every government's going to make mistakes, and every government's not going to make, you know, it doesn't matter. They're going to do some good stuff and some bad stuff. But no point just touting the good stuff and not the bad stuff. Hmm. Well, I, I think all I will say is that for the, in the coming years, some of the challenges and opportunities, there'll be a lot of skirmishes. We're about to fight a war on sausages <laughs> because the UK is saying they want to renegotiate the Northern Ireland you know, uh, agreement. Um, so we're going to see a lot of that, especially in the run-up to elections. So every time someone in Europe has an election, that's a good reason to, to play to your local audience, including in Britain, right, by causing a skirmish. So we'll see that. But I think that the, the near-term opportunity is ledger technologies. So there are, uh, I know of projects in bits of UK government and within our trading kind of um, world to try and move things more onto a ledger-based system, which means that you can still fulfill the local regulatory requirements because you know the underlying, you know, that you can trace through the whole supply chain ultimately what's going on. And so you can see if it fits or doesn't fit. Um, that'll take time to build. It's true. It's maybe not 40 years, maybe, you know, five to 10 years. Given, remember, we had, two, we had iPhones in 2008, right? So that was, and look how, look how the world has changed. So the final thing is, I think we do need to decentralize a lot of our manufacturing, not all of it, but it is now cheaper to make certain goods with robots in the UK than it is in China, because the robots in the UK are basically the same price as the robots in China. And the main difference is the cost of the travel to get the, the goods from China to UK. So some things will continue to be made in the old system, the model that we've had, but increasingly there may be opportunities, particularly with fast turnaround or small batches to make things you know, in a more decentralized way. And healthcare is an example, right? The, 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 our system of healthcare is massively centralized. I would much rather have you know, X-ray machines in the in the high street or in my house, and not have to catch COVID in hospital, which is a lot of what a lot of people did. So I think the difference between the way the the cottage industry, which is our vaccination research and R and D industry, much smaller, much more you know decentralized. Yes, it then goes into a massive centralized pharmaceuticals global system, but that's a huge contrast to our healthcare system, which is still a post-war centralized model. Which really, there's a few people making decisions at the top, including whether to send people to those care homes. And that's the world I want us to move away from. And Britain has to do this now. So maybe we can be part of helping to shape that world in the future. Well, we should adopt a blockchain straight away. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's, that's what Ledger is. Okay, so uh, I think we're reaching the, the, the end of the, the session. I just want to ask one question. Uh, one of the big debates uh, during uh, uh, um, over the last few years was about uh, setting up trade agreements uh, uh, beyond the EU. Um, do you see now any move towards get, getting closer relationship uh, with India, with China, with the United States, with other markets? And uh, what is your uh, what's, what is your take on that, uh, Moti? Do you want to start? Yeah, definitely. Negotiation is progressing. Some trade agreements have been agreed at. Uh, uh, letter of intent levels, so this is good progress. Uh, but in most cases for us, these are not practical for the raw material chemical industry because India is highly competitive. It's uh, not something that will help the UK. Australia, New Zealand are very small markets. The USA is one closed market.